Today's speaker is Sylvia Serfati from the University of um, uh, Paris, um, Laboratoire Jacques-Louis Lyons. Uh, she's also got a visiting position at the current Institute um, for Mathematical Sciences in New York. And she's a, she's, um, a member of the um, L'Institut Universitaire de, de, de France. Uh, Sylvia's work is in nonlinear partial differential equations, particularly in equations that are motivated by problems in physics and which, ad which address realistic problems in physics, not simply models of issues that arise in physics. She's very highly distinguished for her work in um, micromagnetism and on the ginzburg lanzfeld equation in um, superconductivity, and more recently in questions arising in statistical mechanics. She was an invited speaker at the ICM in Madrid in 2006 and at the European Congress of Mathematicians in 2012. She's the recipient of the 2012 Henri Poincaré Prize um, awarded by the International Association for Mathematical Physics and the 2013 Grand Prix Mergier Bourdie of the French Academy of Sciences. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to to you, um, Sylvia Serfati, who will give her talk this afternoon on crystallization questions for systems with Coulomb and Rees interactions. Sylvia. Thank you very much. So I would like, um, of course, to thank the whole uh, organization for this, uh, this honor of um, getting a chance to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk about some um, problems related to crystallizations, as I said, in. Um, as the title says, in systems with Coulomb and Ries interactions. And here is a, an opportunity to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators on this topic. So let me start with a very simple, I'll try to finish with this. So, so let, let me start with um, situating the, the, the problem directly. Uh, we're interested in this type of interaction energy, or Hamiltonian, if you, if you think uh, of it from the point of view of physics. And this type of energy, as we will see later, arises in uh, various problems from physics and also from approximation theory. So it's, a, it's an energy in which you have um, a sum of pair interaction uh, between points x i at locations x i. So sum of w of x i minus x j depends on the basically essentially on the distance between the points. And there is some confinement potential here. And so the points xi's are um, living freely in Euclidean space Rd. And the type of interaction potentials that I'm interested in are essentially inverse powers of the distance or uh, minus log of the distance. Okay, so when it's an inverse power, I will require S to be between dimension minus two and dimension strictly. And I call that the, you can call that the Reese case, Reese interaction case. Um, or it's here a log gas case where it's the logarithmic interaction. And of uh, main interest is the situation where the exponent S is D minus two, because as you know, in that case, uh, one over X to the D minus two is up to a factor the Coulomb kernel, or if you want, the fundamental solution to the Laplacian. So it has an important physical meaning. Okay, so V here is some um, nice function, which is supposed to be a confining potential to be sufficiently smooth. And the most important thing is it has to grow at infinity. And so it keeps the particles together because if you see, if you try to minimize uh, this interaction, um, these terms are all repulsive, so all the points uh, like to be uh, far apart from each other. And so if there is no confinement term, then the, then the system of particles will simply fly off to infinity, like th there would be no uh, minimum achieved. And so when you have a, a confining potential V that grows sufficiently fast, then this term balances the strength of that term. You see here, this term is of order n squared, the number of pairs of particles. And this term is also of order n squared. So they are of the same order, and this is the reason for the n in front of the sum here. So of course, we'll be interested in understanding um, this type of 
systems when n goes to infinity. Oops. Okay. So here is an example of uh, what the numerics tell you for a logarithmic interaction in the plane with quadratic confinement potential and 29 points. So you see the, the points are staying together and they are staying in a, actually in a, in a region that looks like a disk and they are pretty well, uh, well distributed. So I, I'm going to now review um, some motivations for studying such systems. As I said, the first motivation, um, and, and it's not in any particular order, um, is uh, approximation theory, uh, more particularly what's called fekete points or fekete sets. So this corresponds to the case of the logarithmic pair interaction, where you see that it, if you're in a logarithmic case, if you minimize the Hamiltonian HN, it's the same as maximizing, uh, essentially something that's the product of distances multiplied by some weights. Uh, so this is because the exponential of the log is just uh, identity. So minimizing exponential minus log is maximizing product. And the things that maximize uh, such quantities are called weighted fekete sets and they are related to uh, the zeros of orthogonal polynomials. They come up in approximation theory. So there is a large literature on the study of such sets. People are in particular interested in those, uh, those sets on manifolds in, and in particular on spheres like the Earth, for example, uh, where you just try to maximize product of distances, which is the same as minimizing minus sum of log of distances. Of course, if you're in a manifold, then you don't need any confinement, uh, confinement term uh, because the, the, the particles are already confined to the manifold. And this is related also to uh, Smale's seventh problem uh, for the 21st century. He formulated a problem which consists in finding um, almost minimizers of such quantities with the possible error of C log N and in poly polynomial time, it's a problem which is still, uh, still open. And the reason why uh, these, these, uh, these sets are important is, is because they are uh, the points that we, um, allow you to get the smallest possible error when you interpolate a function. So when you want to compute integrals, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, for a function defined on a, say a sphere, for example, you would like to interpolate the function at certain points. And so the, this is the minimization of the quadrature error in a way uh, that tells you uh, this criterion that you want to maximize such quantities. So people then became also interested in uh, the Ries versions, what they call Ries versions of these types of energy where you replace the log by uh, one over distance to the power s, simply because the log can be seen as a limit of such powers when s goes to zero. And then they're interested um, in understanding these types of minima just for the sake of, uh, of it for, for any s. And so there is a lot of literature on this. Here are examples of numerical simulations where you find the minimal S energy points for a particular torus. So here this is the logarithmic case. Here this is S equals one, S equals 0.8, S equals two. And you can see where the points decide to distribute themselves depends on S. And in particular, they, they, they actually proved um, a result which they call the poppy seed bagel theorem, uh, which says that there is a critical S above which the points cover the whole torus. So the torus, of course, is the bagel and the, the points are the poppy seeds. But in, in England, you don't eat bagels very much. <laughs> so this, is, this is a joke for New York or something. Um, the second motivation is uh, coming from statistical mechanics. So I want to take this Hamiltonian that I considered before, but I want to put it now inside a statistical mechanics problem or to form the Gibbs measure associated to it. Um, so forming the Gibbs measure means considering exponential minus beta times the Hamiltonian where beta represents an inverse temperature. And so this becomes the probability, the probability density, which is the probability of observing the configuration at x1, xn. And you need to normalize by z 
n beta, which is a number called the partition function, to make this a probability. Okay, so then um, configurations with very large energy are rather unlikely, and configurations with small energy are more likely, but this is all measured by temperature. So again, in the particular case of the logarithmic interaction in dimensions one and two, so this is a situation which we will often uh, consider, uh, which, which is one of the most important, probably. Then again, you see that exponential minus minus log uh, can be uh, simplified, and you find yourself again with a product of distances to the power beta, and this, so this becomes this expression. And when beta is precisely two, then this is the square of a van der Mond determinant. And this is a particular algebraic structure uh, which makes this law belong to a particular class which is called the class of determinantal point processes. So it's determinantal precisely because it's related to a determinant. And so I won't go very much into details of that, but th there's a lot of uh, study on such point processes which are relying on precisely this algebraic structure that lives underneath. So you can compute things from uh, the point of view um, with the help of the algebra. And so it's also um, of importance because it's related to random matrix models. As was first noticed by Wigner and Dyson, these particular laws that I uh, just wrote down here, in the particular case of the logarithmic interaction, correspond to some standard classical random matrix models that are the GUE, the GOE, and the Gini ensemble. So what are these? Um, so you take a square n by n matrix and you draw the entries at random in a Gaussian IID fashion, okay? So then you can compute the law for the eigenvalues. It's just an algebra computation, or a characteristic polynomial computation, essentially. And you find that the law of the eigenvalues is going to have exactly a form like this. So more precisely, when you're in the GUE, this is the Gaussian unitary ensemble, then in fact you're um, drawing your entries at random but you're requiring the matrix to be complex Hermitian. So when the matrix is complex Hermitian, the eigenvalues must be real and so you get a law for real numbers. You, you get a law on the real line. And so that corresponds to dimension one. You see dimension is the, is the dimension where the, the points live and your points are eigenvalues. This corresponds to dimension one, and the law is exactly of this form with beta equals two. So this particular temperature two appears, and the confinement potential has to be taken x squared over two. The GOE is very similar. It's the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, so this time the matrix is real symmetric. So again, the eigenvalues are real, and you find the law of the same form, but for beta equals one. And then you have the Gini ensemble, which is the uh, complex square matrix with no symmetry. Then, of course, the eigenvalues can be anywhere in the complex plane, and we identify the complex plane with R2. And then you get a law on R2 for the points, which corresponds to D equals 2, beta equals 2, and again, quadratic confinement. Okay, so the system I started with here I can call it a Coulomb gas, or a Ries gas, according to the type of interaction. And what this is telling you is that the eigenvalues of these matrix ensembles uh, are behaving exactly like a Coulomb gas or a log gas uh, for very particular values of temperature. So when you have these very particular values of temperature, then a lot of things are understood because then you have a matrix model. So basically because you can represent those probabilities as related to um, the laws of eigenvalues of a certain random matrix ensemble, and then you have a sort of algebra that can help you compute many things, and essentially um, I would say almost everything is understood in very fine details. So this is all the, the work of the community of random matrix theory, probability uh, theory, etc. 
So they can essentially understand and compute everything. But this is limited a priori to these very specific values of temperature and to dimensions one and two, because uh, beyond dimension two, you are no longer um, the eigenvalues of anything. Okay, so the, the thing to remember is that, uh, so, so these, these models were introduced, these random matrix models were introduced uh, to model um, the spectra of, very, uh, of, of operators, you know, of um, Hermitian operators, for example. So you think of an operator as a very large matrix, and a random operator would be a matrix in which you draw the entries at random. And so this was, this was introduced to model the, to understand the eigenlevels of atoms, of large atoms, um, the spectra of large atoms. And what you see is that the, there is this phenomenon of repulsion of eigenvalues. You see, because if eigenvalues are, very, are, too, are close, uh, then uh, the probability is rather low, which is the same as saying that the points repel each other with the logarithmic interaction. Okay, so this is another um, motivation. And as I said, what we would like to do is understand these things, but without any restrictions on temperature or on dimension or even on confinement potential. Here is a plot to give you an idea of the uh, Gini ensemble, so where you draw the eigenvalues uh, you draw the entries at random without symmetry, and so you see the eigenvalues occupy a disk. Uh, they they, they uh, arrange themselves pretty uniformly in a disk. And then there is a microstructure, a fine structure of the uh, set of eigenvalues, which you can see is kind of fuzzy, so there is a, a certain disorder that you, can, uh, that you can detect, and which is related to this temperature, like, heuristically, you know, to this beta equals two uh, temperature. So we will come back to this uh, later. The third motivation is, um, is from a, a different realm of physics, uh, condensed matter physics, and the Gins-Borlando uh, model of superconductivity, and this is how we actually originally came to this type of problem. So let me say a word about superconductivity. It's a phenomenon uh, that was discovered um, that happens on metallic alloys at low temperature. So when they're at sufficiently low temperature, they lose their resistivity and there are superconducting currents that can flow without energy dissipation. So these are called by, uh, created by Cooper pairs of superconducting electrons. And the creation of these Currents without uh, energy dissipation allow, uh, allows the creation of uh, magnetic fields that counter any magnetic field you try to apply to the superconductor. So in other words, the phenomenon which is called the Meissner effect is that a superconductor can expel a magnetic field. And so if you put the superconductor above a magnet, it can levitate like this. Okay, so then Landau and Ginzburg propose this very famous model called the landau ginzbohr or ginzbohr landau model, which says, you know, in their model, which, is purely, which was purely phenomenological, uh, the state of the system is the ground state of this energy functional. So you have to minimize a certain energy functional and it will describe the state of the material. This works for superconductors. It's also appropriate for, uh, very similar to models for Superfluids in rotation, Bose-Einstein condensate, etc. So, um, Ginzburg, in particular, got the Nobel Prize for this, for this uh, um, the introduction of this model. And Lando, of course, had already had the Nobel Prize for many other things, anyway. So, here is a, a rewriting of this Ginzburg-Lando functional. I won't give too much detail on it, but it's, so it's a problem of calculus of variations, or PDE, if you want. Um, here it's modeled in a 2D domain. There are two unknowns, A, which is the gauge of the magnetic field, and Psi, which is a complex valued wave function. And the most important objects here for me are the vortices, which are the zeros of the complex wave function. So there are points uh, which are surrounded by a circulation of phase, uh, which actually is related to the superconducting currents that I talked about before. So it's, it's exactly like vortices in a fluid, if, um, if you are more familiar with that. And here there are two parameters, HEX and epsilon. HEX represents the intensity of the external applied field. 
And epsilon is a material parameter which actually represents also the length scale of the vortices. And we take it uh, very small too, um, uh, because this is, this is relevant for materials, but also because when epsilon gets small, it means that my vortices are more and more like points. Uh, the, the, the length scale of the vortex becomes very small. The vortex becomes like a point. So we worked for uh, many years on this model with Etienne Fournier. And what we showed is that in the end, the minimization of this functional um, essentially reduces to the minimization of uh, Hamiltonian-like HN, where you have a Coulomb interaction between the vortices. Okay, so Coulomb in 2D, which means logarithmic. So the vortices repel each other logarithmically, and if you want to understand the minimization of this, you might as well understand the minimization of the discrete problem, HN, which is a priori much simpler. So this is a sort of analog of what had been done for a simplified model by uh, Betuel, Brésis, and Ella, but where they always assume that there's a fixed um, and bounded number of vortices. Okay, so reduction of a complicated uh, minimization problem to a discrete minimization problem. Another motivation for studying this, um, uh, this Hamiltonian HN. And coming back to my uh, superconductors, what happens in the experiments is that if you apply a magnetic field, at first you see nothing and the, the sample expels the applied magnetic field, as I said before, in the Meissner effect. And then you reach a first critical field that's called HC1, where the uh, magnetic field starts to penetrate, and in fact it penetrates via the vortices. So the vortices start to appear. As I said, they repel each other, but also their number increases when the applied magnetic field is increased. So you have points, and there's more and more of them, but they repel each other and they are confined to stay within the same sample. So you can see the similarity with the original problem, points that are confined to stay together, but also repelling. And what does the experiment show? The experiment shows this. The vortices, you see, arrange themselves in perfect lattices, triangular lattices. So these are, these are pictures of experiments. So now these lattices are called Abrikosov lattices from the name of the physicist Abrikosov who predicted that they should arise in superconductors. So he took the ginzburg landau model, which up to then was purely phenomenological, and he made computations and predicted there, sh there should be some periodic uh, solutions to these equations. And, and, and then these Abrikosov lattices were observed. So it was a, an example of great success of a, of a theory which was able to make a prediction that was observed. And he also got the Nobel Prize for this. Okay, so it seems to, be, to us that at least nature seems to say that the best way to organize if you don't like your neighbors but are forced to live together with them in a room is to uh, place yourself in triangular lattices. And we want to explore somehow why that is or how we can describe this. Okay, so let me come back now to the original problem and this is the end of the motivations. Now I want to give you a little bit of the um, analysis that we can do on this problem. So first I'll recast uh, some some things that are not difficult and well known, that have been well known for many years, which is on the leading order of the minimum of the Hamiltonian. So we assume again that the confinement potential V grows sufficiently fast. It's not too difficult to prove that minimizing this problem is in fact equivalent to minimizing that problem. Where this problem here in red is like if you want the continuum version of this problem. Okay, so here you have um, interaction between points that you can see as masses or point charges if you were doing electrostatics. And here you have a continuum version where you integrate against a distribution or a probability measure mu. Okay, so the only difference between this and that is that now you have relaxed to all probability measures and you have, uh, 
put back in the interaction, the self-interaction of the distribution. Here you have to remove the diagonal, you see, you have to remove i equals j because it gives rise to an infinite term. W is infinite at zero. But here you put it back and there is a little bit of work to do, but you can check that in fact all these things are equivalent in the sense which is written here that if you take minimizers of this problem, you form the sum of Dirac masses at the points x, i normalized by n, so you form a probability measure, which is like the empirical measure of the configuration. Then this will converge up to extraction, but in fact it will converge to the probability measure mu v, which is the unique minimizer of this, and the minimum of hn normalized by n squared will converge to E of mu v. Okay? So now this, this problem you can check is convex, strictly convex. And in fact, it has a minimizer, a unique minimizer, provided that V is nice enough. And this minimizer is called the equilibrium measure or the Frostman equilibrium measure. So this, the minimization of E is really a classical problem in potential theory that was solved in the 1930s that was originally even considered by Gauss. And okay, so there is, uh, there is a unique minimizer, that's the equilibrium measure, we'll call it mu v. And so this tells us that if you take minimizers, they will distribute themselves on average according to this distribution mu v. Okay, so if you, if you were to go back to the, uh, the setting of the torus, for example, you see here mu v would be the uniform distribution on the red part. And here mu v would be the uniform measure on the whole torus, for example. So this only gives you the macroscopic behavior of the system. It tells you where the points like to distribute themselves. Here mu v would be characteristic function of this disk. Right, so I have a uniform distribution on the disk. But that's of course not enough, we want to understand Further, we want to understand the microscopic distribution. Okay, so for now, let me write a few assumptions. So I will denote by sigma the support of the equilibrium measure. And I will assume that sigma is nice, so it's compact, it has a nice boundary. And I will also assume that mu v is nice. It has to be a measure with a density, and the density is even assumed to be holder continuous in the support and bounded, of course, bounded above and uh, with a certain behavior near the boundary. So this is not all very important. It's just sort of technical uh, assumptions. But let's look at examples. So in the Coulomb case with a quadratic confinement potential, you find that the equilibrium measure is a characteristic function of the unit ball properly normalized to be a probability. So this is exactly like the examples I showed you before. The points will distribute themselves uniformly in a ball if you have the Coulomb case and a quadratic confinement. So this is maybe the model to keep in mind. Uh, this law corresponds to what's called the circle law in the context of random matrices. Another example that's important is dimension one with logarithmic uh, interaction and again quadratic potential. Then you find that mu v is a measure which has this density. This density is exactly the graph of a semicircle. Uh, and that corresponds to what's called the semicircle law in random matrices. Okay, so now we want to go beyond, as I said, we're gonna have n points in this region of characteristic size one, so a typical distance n to the minus one over dimension. So there are two scales in the problem. There's the scale of the support of the equilibrium measure, and of course there is the scale of the distance between the points, which is, which is this, this small scale. And we want to understand what happens at this small scale. So this is a rough uh, sketch. Huh? So the points will be expected to live in the set sigma. So now we want to zoom, multiply, so look around um, a blow up point, call it x naught here. Zoom everything by multiplying by n to the one over d. Then what I get is a configuration of points which are now well separated. So typical distances are expected to be one. 
And when n goes to infinity, there's more and more points, then this configuration is going to become infinite. Right, so when I zoom, if I zoom inside the sample, I mean inside sigma, I will get an infinite configuration of points. And the goal is to define an energy, an interaction energy for this infinite configuration. So what we will do is we want to understand the minimum of the energy to next order. And to do that, we want to expand uh, the sum of Dirac masses around the n times the equilibrium measure, so around the equilibrium position. And want to try to understand what the next order in the Hamiltonian is telling us. So the next order, the idea is the next order will tell us, will give us information about what's happening at the microscopic scale. So we combine this with the blow up that I described. And we will define, as I said, an interaction energy, which will be called W, for these infinite configurations of points. Now, the total energy that I had originally will be essentially the average of this W over all possible blow up centers in this set sigma. So you see, if I zoom here, I see one limiting configuration. If I zoom there, I see another limiting configuration. They can have nothing to do with each other, possibly. So for each blob center, I see a different limiting pattern. And I need to average, in the end, over all these blob centers to recover the whole uh, energy that I had originally. Okay, so now the goal in the next few slides will be to get to the definition of this object W. So uh, before that, I give you an example of uh, the result that we, one of the results we get at the end, which is, as I promised, an expansion of the minimal energy, but to next order. So this is results that were obtained incrementally with different collaborators. So first we did the dimension two log logarithmic case, then we did dimension one logarithmic, then we did all Coulomb cases, and finally, we have a proof that encompasses all the previous cases and the risk cases. And so in the minimum of HN, you recognize the term that we had before, n squared times the energy of the equilibrium measure, this E of mu V. So this is what was known before. But now we have a next order term, which lies at the order n to the 1 plus S over D, where S, I recall, is the power in the interaction, in the pairwise interaction. So this is in the case of power interactions. And the second line is in the case where the interaction is logarithmic in dimensions one or two. Then it, you see it's a little different. I have an n log n factor and then an n order term. And so these expansions tells us that there is an asymptotic term at this order. And it's a constant, the, the leading, uh, the next, uh, the prefactor, if you want, is a certain constant which I can explicitly express in terms of the density of the equilibrium measure uh, arising here or here, and in terms of a constant CSD, which only depends on S and D. So it doesn't depend on the confinement potential V. It only depends on the interaction kernel and the dimension. And it will be what? It will be exactly the minimum of this function W that will be defined next. Okay, so the method, as I said, relied on, relies on trying to expand the en energy to next order. So we look at quadratic terms. So we exploit the, the, the quadratic nature of the, of the interaction. And we rewrite it as a W integrated against sum of Dirac masses, but on the complement of the diagonal, if you remember. So this denotes complement of the diagonal. And you can expand around the uh, equilibrium measure times n, so n mu v, n mu v, plus the terms in the difference plus cross terms. But so when you put all the, the terms in the energy together, the idea is that we're expanding around a minimizer of this E, uh, curl E uh, functional. And so when you expand around a minimum, then it's like a Taylor expansion. The, the first order should disappear and you should get a second order term. And so this is the idea of what happens. The cross terms will essentially disappear, and we will be left with only understanding this type of term, which is what? Which is the, let's think of Coulomb interaction. Huh? 
This is, this is the Coulomb interaction of a system of charges formed by Dirac masses, positive singular charges at the points x, i, and a negative charge, minus n mu v, which is smooth, you know, which is regular, which, is, which has a density. And this whole system is neutral. There are n points here, and this is of mass n. So there is a sum of discrete charges and a neutralizing diffuse charge, if you want. And you want to understand the Coulomb interaction of this system. This will be done via the potential that's generated by the distribution, which is just this. You convolve W uh, with this distribution. And let me now, from now on, just talk about the Coulomb case. So writing this, of course, implies that I solve that. It's the same as solving Laplacian Hn equals blah up to a constant Cd that depends only on dimension. So the potential generated by the system of charges, if you want, is just a solution to Laplace's equation with right-hand side equals to the distribution of charges. And so this uh, quantity that I want to understand, I can, after all, rewrite it like this. So after doing some integration by parts, it would become formally integral of gradient Hn squared. So instead of looking at the sum of pairwise interactions, I look at an integral quantity expressed in terms of the potential. Now this integral, this is cheating because this integral is infinite. And this is due to the fact that here I, I forgot to remove the diagonal. So if I remove, you know, having to remove the diagonal means I have to do something here to make this term finite. And so there is a procedure that you can call renormalization that needs to be done. So this is the basis of the computation. And then, of course, it will have to be combined with the rescaling that I mentioned before. And all this to justify how we get to the following definition of what we call the renormalized energy, which is this energy for this infinite system, which is formed by an infinite number of Dirac charges and a neutralizing background. So you see now, let's look at this definition. We, we take m, which is a number which corresponds to the density of the neutralizing background. And we take an infinite configuration of points, so a sum of Dirac masses, possibly with multiplicity. And we look at all potentials which satisfy this type, this equation. So minus Laplace and h has to be the same constant depending on dimension, times the sum of Dirac masses minus the uniform distribution of density m. Okay, and then you form these quantities, and then we will infimize over all possible h's. So what are these quantities? You take big boxes, so you take boxes of larger and larger size, and you compute the integral of gradient h squared, just like I described before, you normalize by the volume of the box. Except, as I said, these things are infinite and you need to renormalize them, and the renormalization is done via this parameter eta. So, what is it, this h eta? Well, h eta is the same as h, except you sort of truncate uh, all the peaks. So, there are, there are some infinite peaks, you truncate them exactly at the level w of eta. Then it will make this finite, but of course when eta goes to zero, it will become very large, and so you subtract off exactly what you expect to be. So when you subtract off, of course you have to believe me, uh, doing this and taking the limit as eta goes to zero, I claim is exactly the same as removing the diagonal in the first place. So I had these self-interactions between the points that I want to remove, it's exactly the same as truncating here at the level of this uh, energy. And so now I can define a number, which is W of gradient H, which is this limit. I claim this limit exists. And then I can define W uh, mat BB um, of, of the configuration. It's the total uh, Coulomb interaction energy of the configuration. And, and so this is, this is not an obvious thing to do. Because if you have an infinite configuration, if you wanted to sum all pairs of uh, interactions, it's not clear how to make a series that converges. 
Here we use the fact that there is a neutralizing background and we use this um, uh, expression which is extensive in space via the potential H instead of thinking of pair interactions for this. Okay, so this is the quantity. So it has some nice properties. For example, being a, a finite WM means that the average number of points in a big box has to be M. That's because essentially the configuration has to be roughly neutral. So the configuration with the background of, of intensity M has to be roughly neutral. So it means M is the uh, point intensity, if you want, or is the, is, the, is the number of points per unit volume. And of course, once you've realized that, you can always scale out to have M equals one by taking your configuration, shrinking it or zooming it a little bit, you will get a configuration with density of points one. And there is a formula for how it transforms. You can prove that W is bounded below, which is not completely obvious, and that it has a minimizer. And you can also prove that the minimum will be achieved as the limit of energies of periodic configurations with larger and larger periods. So now I want to show you how you can compute these things. So assume you have a configuration which is now periodic. So it's, you take a torus and you have n points on the torus or you take a configuration in a box and you repeat it infinitely many times. That's what I mean by configuration. Then I claim that my complicated expression of W, I can rewrite it as a sum of pairwise interactions. So I recover what I thought it was, which is the sum of pairwise interactions, except here, the pairwise interactions are related not to the Coulomb kernel, but to the Green's function of the underlying torus. So it's not solution to Laplace G equals Dirac, but it's solution to Laplace G equals Dirac minus uh, the constant, the normalizing constant that makes this a periodic function. So these, uh, these periodic Green's functions can be computed almost explicitly, so they are expressed via series, Eisenstein series. Um, and such quantities are actually arise in Arikelov theory. So if you want to understand the minimum of W, what I said in the last slide is that it would suffice to understand the minima, the minimization of such problems over larger and larger tori. But the problem is that even in a small torus, we don't know how to minimize this. So it suffices to understand the, intera the minimal interaction of n points in a periodic uh, setting. Okay, so what we proved in the end is that if you start from minimizers of the Hamiltonian Hn, if you blow up at the scale I said, around a point in the support of the equilibrium measure, then almost all the time you will see a minimizer of W, W respective to the density of points, of course, which is the density of the equilibrium measure at the place where you zoom. So if you zoom at a place where mu v is very large, then the density of points will be very large. If you zoom at a place where mu v is smaller, the density will be smaller in the end, but this is all unimportant. But so what's, what's important is that you reduce this minimization problem to another to a limiting minimization problem, which is to minimize this function W. And so this is what we obtain in this series of papers. In the Ginzburg-Landau problem that I mentioned before, you have the same result, essentially. So if you take a minimizer of the Ginzburg-Landau energy, if you have a suitable regime, if you zoom at the suitable scale, then you look at your point vertices, the limits of the configuration of point vortices will have to minimize W. Same story. We have the same result for the Otto Kawasaki model, if you know this. And of course, this whole thing comes with the next order expansion of the minimal energy, which I described to you before. So now we are left with this question, which is we want to understand, we are left with understanding minimizers of W. What do they look like? So there's only a few positive results. A positive result in dimension one, the minimum of W is achieved by the lattice Z. 
So it's achieved when you put the points exactly regularly. Not a very big surprise. In dimension two, the only thing we can prove is the following, that the minimum of W within the class of lattice configurations with fixed volume is uniquely achieved by the triangular lattice. Okay, so if you look at all lattices of volume one, fundamental set of volume one, a square lattice, a triangular lattice, you have only two parameters that you can vary. And then the triangular, which I call Abrikozov, like in superconductivity, triangular Abrikozov lattice is the best. So at least this W can distinguish among lattices and it tells you that a triangular lattice is better than a square lattice, for example. How do you prove something like this? Well, in fact, it boils down to a problem in number theory, which was solved in the 50s, 60s. It's the question of minimization of the Epstein zeta function of the lattice. So you look at the, so this is the Epstein zeta function, sum over points in the lattice, one over p to the s, and it was proven that this is uniquely minimized among lattices of volume one by the triangular lattice. So you just have to take our problem and sort of map, map it to this problem. And this way you show triangular lattice is the best. Now if you go to higher dimension, what's very striking is that even this result on the zeta function has no equivalence. So there is a sort of conjecture or suspicion maybe that the BCC, the body-centered cubic lattice uh, plotted here, would be the minimizer among lattices of the Epstein zeta function, but this is not proven. So let alone understand the minimization of W among all configurations. It's not even understood among lattices. Okay, so we are naturally led to this conjecture, which is in dimension two, we tend to believe that this Abrikozov triangular lattice is not only a minimizer among lattices, but it's a minimizer, a true minimizer among all possible configurations. This conjecture we made in the context of Ginzburg Landau, which as you have seen in experiments, do form Abrikozov lattices. So it's a sort of experimental uh, verification of the conjecture. Uh, another confirmation comes from this fact that Betterman proved that this conjecture is equivalent to another one made by Brochard, Hardin, and Saf, which they obtained by very different arguments by making um, analytic continuation for formulas that they have in the expansion of the minimal logarithmic energy on the sphere. Okay, so we are left with this question. In any case, we believe that W is a measure of disorder of a given point configuration. So the, the lower the W, the more you are crystalline, the more you are ordered, so we believe a lattice. And the higher the W, the more you're disordered. And so this will come at the very end when I talk about situations with temperature. So this slide is just a sidetrack to say there's many questions of this type. Huh? You can always ask yourself, given a certain interaction potential, under which conditions can we say that the minimum of the sum of pairwise interactions in boxes, for example, is achieved by lattices? Well, the answer is we, are, we almost never know, except in dimension one. So I want to stress that this is important because it's related to uh, the crystalline structure of matter. It's related to some, there are some conjectures about topics like this. So for example, the cone kumar conjecture tells you if V has a certain property, which is to be completely monotonic, or f of a complete, the square of a completely monotonic function, then the minimum should be achieved in dimension two by the triangular lattice, still the same one, and by certain special lattices in dimensions eight and 24. So there are some special lattices for these three dimensions. In particular, in dimension two, this Abrikozov lattice you see, is expected to have a sort of universally minimizing property. It's not only a minimizer for our Coulomb interaction, it should be a minimizer for many, uh, for a broad class of interactions. At least that's what's hinted here. There's very, very few instances, as I said, in which one can prove that a minimizer of an interaction is 
is a lattice or is crystalline except in 1D. And so the few positive results are the questions of best packing or hard sphere potentials and a result by Florent Tile where he proves uh, crystallization for a caricature of Leonard Jones potential. So it's a sort of perturbation of the result on best packing. Okay, so now back to my, um, to my questions. I want now to tell you what happens when we have temperature. So if you recall, I now have to look at this probability density, where I put back beta, the inverse and temperature, and I scale things this way. And I have to define a slightly complicated object, but okay, so given the configuration x1, xn, we're going to form something that we call a tagged point process, which is a probability on sigma, the support of the equilibrium measure where things live, cross this capital um, curl X, which is the space of configurations, which is defined this way. So you take, uh, you take the, the, the average over the set sigma of a Dirac mass, which is concentrated at the couple X. So X will re represent the blow up center. And this is what? This is the configuration blown up around X. So for every X, I look at the configuration and I blow it up around X. And I make this into a probability measure. So I make, it, this, I make a Dirac mass at this configuration and I average over all the blow up centers. So X is like the tag, which is the, the place where I zoom. So you can prove that if you have good energy bound, this IN of X1, XN will converge after extraction to a limiting probability P which will be a point process, which means a random, um, a law on, on point configurations with tags and each slice Px, so if you, if you fix the blow up center, is a stationary point process of intensity mu v of x. Okay, and then we can define the w, which is really the average of w for this point process which is defined this way. So you can define first W of a Px, of a, of a point process Px as the average of W with respect to this probability P. So this is just taking the average. You, can, you average W with respect to P and then you integrate over the set sigma the W index with mu V. Okay, so this is all language to say that for each blow up center, we have a, a limiting configuration and a limiting W, and we average them over all the blow up centers. And then we can phrase the following result, which uh, we recently obtained with Thomas Leblay, which says that there is a large deviation principle. So I will explain what this means at speed n with rate function based on this function here. Okay, so you have these limiting point processes, which are these probabilities P. And what you compute is you compute one half times the average of W for this P plus a term which is an entropy. So it's an average of entropies, more precisely. This thing is something that's called a specific relative entropy. So it's a relative entropy, except you have to ha take limits over larger and larger boxes. So this is all because we're in, in, with infinite configurations. And so we have to take, define things as limit over large boxes. And you take the entropy relative to the Poisson point process of intensity one. Okay, so we have a function, a sum of essentially W plus an entropy. And you see it comes with a one over beta here. And what does it mean to have a large deviation principle with this rate? It means, roughly speaking, it means this. So it means that the, the probability that my configurations are in the set A, so my configurations mediated via this Pn, is going to decay like exponential minus beta times the minimum of F beta over A minus the minimum of F beta. So this is what 
essentially is a large deviation principle. And so you see here the minimum of f beta infimum over a minus infimum, this is a positive number, or it could be zero, but it's non-negative. Okay, so this is always exponentially decreasing. And as long as this is strictly positive, then there is an n missing, sorry, here. This will be exponentially decreasing. So there should be an n beta here. So everything will be exponentially, uh, will have exponentially small probability, except if the infimum, here is the infimum over the whole set. So in other words, the only configurations that are observable, that are likely, that don't have very small probabilities, are the ones that minimize this f beta. So in other words, to understand how configurations behave, we only have to understand the minimization of f beta. Everything concentrates on this. So you see, it's no longer minimizing w that you want, but you want to minimize w plus one over beta times entropy. So the temperature comes into play and it perturbs the system, you see? So if temperature beta is infinite, so beta infinite really corresponds to real temperature being zero because beta is an inverse temperature. So if beta is infinite, real temperature is zero. I recover that I want to minimize W. So I find that at zero temperature, I should minimize W and so I should be, I think, conjecturally, a crystal. And then when beta is decreased, when temperature is increased, then the entropy starts to weigh more and more, and so the entropy is going to do what? It's going to create disorder. So you're gonna have a competition between order wanted by this term and disorder wanted by that term. And more precisely, the entropy is a sort of measure of distance, the relative entropy is a sort of measure of distance, so it's going to measure how much your configuration is close to being a Poisson point process. What is a Poisson point process? It's a point process where you throw your points at random in space without them interacting at all. So you don't care whether there was already a point there, you just throw. And so it's a, it's a relatively disordered point process. In particular, the points don't repel each other at all. So this thing is measuring, is measuring how close you are to a Poisson point process, which means the situation where you, ha you would have non-interacting points. And so, of course, it's mediated by temperature, and so there are three possible regimes. Uh, so, as I said, when formerly beta is infinite, you recover the question, that the results that we found for the minimization of Hn. When beta is much bigger than one, you expect crystallization. When beta is much smaller than one, then the entropy dominates, because then this term is much bigger than that term, so you're essentially behaving like a Poisson point process. This is what you should get. Entropy dominates, your system is completely disordered. And when beta is neither small nor large, it's intermediate and you expect that there is a balance between these two effects and no crystallization. So this is, um, this is interesting because in, in the physics literature there's some controversies over whether such a system should crystallize at finite temperature, for example. So it's, the physicists believe that the system should crystallize at finite temperature but this will be measured, in their language, it's only a question of decay of correlation functions. So the decay of correlations will change. However, in the, in the rate function here, in the minimization, you don't see um, a, a, a dramatic change happening at finite temperature. So this can also help because, um, as I said before, in the, in the random matrix literature, Almost everything is understood about certain specific examples in the 1D and 2D log cases. In particular, the limiting point processes are known. They are identified. They are called the sine beta processes or the Ginib point processes. And so you can now characterize these processes as minimizing these quantities. And of course, in 1D, we have a complete crystallization result because we know uh, what minimizers of W are. We know that W crystallize, forces crystallization to a lattice. Uh, so this is the only case where you have a complete crystallization result. And the corollary of the, the large deviation principle is also, so this is maybe for experts, 
a next order expansion of the log of the partition function, which is an important quantity from the point of view of physics, uh, where, we, where we get particular cancellations that happen in the log case. So all to be compared with the results in the, in the probability literature, in particular by the group of Bourgade, Erdo, Xiao, by Boro, Guione, and Sherbina. So all these um, works here understand in, in much depth the case of dimension one and uh, W equals minus log. And as I said before, we can treat much, much more general settings. Okay, so I want to uh, conclude here. The main <laughs> open question probably remains this question of crystallization. Could one identify minimizers of W or of other interactions? And of course, this seems like a very uh, far-fetched um, hope. Um, more accessible, understanding the behavior with temperature in terms of decay of correlation functions and critical temperatures. Uh, we're currently studying systems with oppositely charged particles, which are also of interest in physics, uh, extending to more general interactions. Right, so these are uh, some open questions. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. There's time for a few questions, but before you begin to speak, since this lecture is being streamed live, would you put up your hand and one of the microphones will come to you so that we can capture your question as well as Sylvia's answer. So are there any questions? There's one there. Um, so it's known uh, when you have uh, vortices in confined systems that you can get uh, what's called negative temperature regimes. Uh, so this is prediction by Larson Sagar from the 1940s or 50s. Um, so basically where beta is going negative, but you go negative by passing through um, infinite temperatures. It's, it's a rather kind of uh, curious uh, regime. It, will occur when you have, for example, these oppositely charged systems, but I believe it might also occur when you have singly charged systems, provided mm. the phase space is confined, which is, seems to fit within this regime you're considering. So I'm just wondering whether you've considered this scenario and whether it can be tackled within this framework. Sorry, I missed the end of your question. Oh, so I'm just wondering whether you've basically considered this scenario of the negative temperature, whether you've thought about it at all. Um, um, not in depth, no. I, I know of the negative temperature um, in, in the system of uh, oppositely charged, you know, in the two-component plasma. Uh, I know that people do that. I haven't, I haven't thought about it uh, too seriously yet, but uh, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, lead of, of, of thought. Yeah, Thank you. Other questions? Well, before I ask you to thank Sylvia once again, I've been asked to remind you to vote on the posters which are on display in the core building of the CMS. There's a poster competition, and as with all elections, your vote counts. So please have a look at the posters and, and put your choices on the, the, the sheet that was in your um, welcome pack. Having said that, let's thank Sylvia once again for a very nice lecture. <laughs>